Hello and welcome to this conversation of impact for kids. I'm Cathy Dominey and today my amazing guest is Dr. Laurie Layden. I'm going to actually read her bio to you and then we're going to get on to an amazing conversation. So Dr. Laurie Layden, MBA, is an internationally known humanitarian, trauma healing expert, visionary and spiritual guide. Dr. Layden works in traumatized communities who have experienced genocide, war and school shootings. Laurie also mentors successful influencers and leaders committed to aligning more fully with their destinies in service to global healing. She is the developer of the Grace Process and founder of the nonprofit Create Global Healing. Hello, Dr. Laurie Layden, and thank you so much for joining me today. Well, Kathy, uh, uh, you know, it, this is an auspicious occasion because you and I met through the graces of the beautiful Natalie Ledwell just a year ago. And you also know that um, I work in Australia, even though I'm from California, and what a great affinity I have for um, obviously finding the miracles that can come out of trauma. Mm. And so um, I, I, I'm so excited about this conversation on so many levels. Australia, you, your incredible influence, what you've been accomplishing, which I think is a great gift to all parents. You are a great role model for all parents about what needs to happen moving forward. So I'll be quiet now. Thank you, Laurie. That's very kind of you. Very generous. Um, well, I'm absolutely um, just blown away by your work. And it's such important work because dealing with young people trying to negotiate their way through trauma is huge. And of course, has such a massive impact on their futures if it's not dealt with you know, effectively at that young age. So first of all, for, for people who are listening, what would you define trauma as? Yes. Uh, and that's a big question, but he, here's what I would say. There are four characteristics of, of things that would constitute a trauma. The first is something very unexpected or shocking. Car accident, a, a war, a genocide, all the things we know. Uh, the second is feeling helpless and out of control. The third is feeling completely alone, that you are the only one. Um, having this experience. And the fourth is a sense that your life, whether real or perceived, is in danger. Mm -hmm. um, and so, okay, that, that constitutes what we call big T trauma. Little T traumas can be, I'm in the third grade, I give a book report, and I stutter, and everyone laughs. Mm. Uh, that's a little T that is significant. Um, and I, I know your audience knows many of these as we ask them to just think into the times when they felt contracted or ashamed or, or any of that. Um, but the most important thing to understand, which is not being taught, is the physical effect of trauma on the brain. So most of us feel like, and even general psychology, the general myth in psychology is it's an emotional issue. You, you think it differently, you get over it, you make intentions, you get over it, and you pu pull yourself up from your bootstraps. That is not what happens in trauma. In trauma, it is a brain dysfunction. And so the amygdala is an organ in the brain that we call the smoke detector, which determines, am I safe or am I threatened? And the amygdala will determine whether we're gonna throw stress hormones into the body or whether they're gonna put safety hormones in the body. And then the, the amygdala works with the hippocampus in the brain and the hippocampus is the memory center. So when we've had traumas, uh, that have not been released through the body and somatically, and that's the next issue I'll, I'll address, is that that dysfunction in the brain continues until we somatically release it, uh, which means it's not an emotional issue. It's a, uh, a dysfunction of communication between areas in the brain. So traditionally, we've looked at 
uh, emotional reactions and behaviors. If you look at war veterans, if you look at um, uh, any group of people who have been traumatized, we don't look, we actually diagnose their behavior and we misdiagnose trauma. Misdiagnosis is uh, anxiety, depression. But here's my bugaboo. I don't know if that's an Australian term. Uh, but about uh, young people, young people who have been traumatized have been diagnosed with, uh, what is it called? Uh, it's called uh, uh, objectionable obstinance and defiance. Mm -hmm. There's actually a term that, that mental health providers will give to young people. When we see our young people being um, oppositional and defiant, it is an indication of trauma. But we try to medicate the behavior and we don't go inside to understand what they are being obstinate and rebellious about. So mm -hmm. then the focus becomes on what I call the identified patient. So oftentimes in a family constellation, the parents will be like, we're fine. We don't understand. We've read all the books. We've taken the workshops, but my son or my daughter is exhibiting these signs. And then we disconnect from them. As a parent, we say, oh, that's not my issue. That's my child's issue. And then when I see, uh, when I've been in these, as, as you know, as you discussed, uh, these very traumatized, the most traumatized populations in the world, and parents come and say, you need to fix my child. Mm. The number one thing we need to do, number one thing as parents is commit to doing our own healing first. And I know this about you, and I know that you are committed to that, and I'm sure we can have a, a, a beautiful conversation. So about that, the number one gift I can give anyone as a parent is to say, please do your own work first. Please look into your own trauma patterns. Please look at how you project those onto your children, how you may reject those things in your children because you have not looked into it in yourself. Mm. And that's easier to say it's their behavior. And again, I would say that the best advice I've in and, and years and years in these communities is for parents to really do the work of being fully present in their bodies. You know, <laughs> We could have a very comical conversation uh, and deep conversation at the same time about what it's like to have this many kids and be under this, all this, and now layer COVID on it. So here's what I would also say is that I don't think people really understand that layering COVID on all of this simply exacerbates the traumas that already re existed. So if you feel like you're a conscious parent, and you're doing everything right and you're dealing with quarantine and homeschooling and I mean, it's just too freaking much. Mm. And then add COVID. So let's all be gentle enough to add the understanding that COVID is, is inviting us to look at all of our safety issues, all of our unsafety issues. So as parents, we come in, I'm gonna do it perfectly. I'm going to, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be totally transform everything my parents didn't do, blah, 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 boom. And then you get triggered and, and you're like, you're off to the races. Mm -hmm. so I'm just going to pause there for a moment. Cause I, uh, please, I, I, st I have some advice, but I would also like for you to tell me it, is there more that we need to talk about trauma? I think it's, um, it's great to be able to to really identify it to break it down as to what it what it is because and it, it's different as well for every person 
So exactly. whereas some two people could go through exactly the same experience and just not have it affect them in the same way. So I think it's really important as well within what you're saying is to honor everybody's individual reaction um, to even the same event because we're all wired differently. We all experience it differently. So it's really important as the adults in the situation not to be dismissive um, because we could have two, I could have two of my children from the same home, same upbringing, same, you know, everything. And they could go into the same experience and just have completely different reactions. And I need to be able to honor that. It's not for me to say, oh, why can't you be more like your brother? He, he did this. I need to say, okay, let's talk about this. Let's unpack this then. How, how does it feel for you? Because obviously it, you know, it feels for you differently to it, how it feels for your brother. And I think that's really an important point as well. Oh, well, you're right on, honey. You're right on. You get it. Um, and so oftentimes in these environments, parents in these really traumatic environments that I work in, parents have enough trouble dealing with their own trauma, but they feel like they have to give up their own trauma to take care of their kids. And so they'll come to us and they'll say, fix my kid. I mean, literally, they'll use those words. Oh, please, we have to. But my most important point, and I cannot make it strongly enough, is as a parent, your only job is to work on your own healing first. And if you are being triggered by something, don't look at it like it's Johnny's behavior or Mary's behavior. Look at it. What is it triggering in you? Mm. If you commit to doing that, then you will not project your expectations and your uh, control issues onto your children. So, you know, I, I, and I, I, have, I have many suggestions, but that is the most important thing. If you see a behavior in your children that you are contracting about, and so I'll give people a, a, a great, easy, easy exercise. You can tell whether you're in your negative ego or in your heart very easily. When you're in your negative ego, the negative ego is saying why everything's going wrong, why you're not adequate, why the kids are doing what they're doing. You're going to feel contracted. You're not breathing with a full inhale and a full exhale. Your muscles are contracted. You've got monkey mind going on. There's all these, I can't believe Johnny bit the kid at school. Da, 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 da. And then there's a heightening of your physiology. When your physiology is heightened, you don't have access to the greatest part of your human genius. Uh, and so the heart and the brain work in tandem when we are relaxed and there's or endorphins running through our body. Um, and in those places, we get to tap into our inner wisdom, our sense of connectedness, our sense of problem solving, our sense of uh, connectedness. So the biggest thing for parents to do is to really be tuned in. Am I contracted right now? <laughs> or am I expanded? And I would also say the second thing is to simply be in wonder. Is it possible to be in wonder that in this present moment when all hell seems to be breaking loose and I don't have a resource to do anything, can I just take a breath? Mm. Uh, can I just take a breath and just be in to the present moment and see the love I have for myself and my child? Now, the important thing about this is I use EFT tapping, which you're familiar with, and which I partner with uh, the best researcher in the world right now, who is an Australian uh, woman from Bonn University. Her name is Peta Stapleton, P-E-T-A Stapleton. You know this. I hope you will include the link to her website because when I talk about tapping, um, she has a beautiful self-care instruction manual about how to tap for self-care. What happens in, in EFT tapping is that we literally reset our own 
physiology. And um, I think parents will understand this word self-regulation, right? Mm. Every parent has seen their child's uh, educational plan and it all includes self-regulation, but what do they do to help them with self-regulation? EFT tapping is an amazing opportunity for that. So it helps regulate the, 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 the parent and the child. So I'm just going to pause there because I'm can, I can go into some advice there, but is there something else you'd like to, uh, uh, is there, is there an answer I need to offer? I was actually, um, while you were talking there, I went back to my teaching days. Um, so I came out of my parent brain and went into my teacher brain. And I remember being at school and I worked in a very um, challenging school and the children had lots of things going on at home that I've never experienced. Um, so they, they were bringing that with them to maths and science and English and all of that sort of thing. And I remember being able to take a class that was very volatile um, and aggressive and coming from that place of love that you were talking about. And what we were able to do, um, actually to get them engaged with their academics, is start from that place of love and look beyond the behavior. Because I think people get caught up in reactionary energy um, and they're looking at the behavior and they're reacting to the behavior and they're reacting to the behavior, but not actually getting behind what's caused that behavior. And when we did that, not just as a teaching staff, but as the children as well, you know, to practice that pause and to, to see the behavior that is unacceptable and all the rest of it and aggressive, but actually seeing that the, the energy behind that behavior was this need for safety, connection, uh, belonging. Um, and I think, you know, it's really important to not get caught up in that reactionary energy but to practice that pause and reach through beyond that and say, okay, what's happened, you know? And I remember one of my kids, um, taller than me, I'm only a hobbit from the Shire, but he came in, he was a year five, he was very tall um, and he was very aggressive this morning and he was slamming and he was shoving and he was really being completely inappropriate in a classroom setting. But I had this beautiful relationship with my class and they just looked at me and I winked at them. I've seen it. It's okay, carry on with your day. And, um, you know, we, we suspended the maths lesson, everyone quiet read, and I took him outside and said, hey, what's happening? What's wrong? How can I help you? How can I be here for you today? And he burst into tears, this great big lad, and he's, um, his house had been raided for drugs that morning by the police. So you can't expect that child to come into the classroom sit down and do two hours of maths and English. It just, you know, a, an adult wouldn't be able to do that. So I love what you're saying about coming from that place of love, being present and really thinking in that expansive way of not just butting heads and, and seeing what's right in front of you, but seeing beyond that. So now let's add, and again, I'm a proponent of EFT tapping. I mentioned Peter Stapleton's website. But this is the work that I've been taking around the world since 2007. And if you had told me, Kathy, and even when we met, if, if, you, if I said to you, oh, you know, Kathy, I run around the world and I tap on my head and my body, you'd be like, what the hell? <laughs> but it's based on ancient Chinese acupressure points combined with positive psychology. And when we do this, we can do this with groups, we can do it with individuals. And in these most traumatized communities that I've been in, and you know, my, my deep love for Australia, and I've been coming to Australia for two months a year for since 2017 until COVID, um, and going to very remote communities like Fitzroy Crossing and um, and some places I can't even, I'm not really good at uh, knowing how to say the name of some of the places I've been. Um, and it doesn't mean I don't have respect for that. It's just, um, it's just kind of not in my natural uh, uh, verbology. But we know that uh, Australian Aboriginal teens have the highest suicide rate of any uh, teenagers in the world. 
This is why we're doing what we're doing. In Rwanda, since I've been working there in 2007 after the genocide, and of course we know Aboriginal people experienced a genocide as well, and, and now a socially and culturally and economic genocide continues. Um, I realize that those young people never felt safe in their bodies, and so mm -hmm. they could never be functioning people because they didn't feel safe in their bodies. So I, I created Project Light, which is um, a, a program to actually scale and replicate training for all the service providers of young people, parents, educators, service providers, every health care, every mental health care, incarceration, every, all of those organizations we have trained now. Oh, uh, and, and that's our joy is to, to bring that work in support of young people who need trauma healing, they need economic sustainability, and they need heart-centered leadership so we can count on our next generation of young people to heal and work and lead us into a p peaceful future. Mm. So I realize this is a heavy conversation, but, and, and I have many easy sound bites, but I cannot stress enough that parents must commit to their own healing first. Mm. And they must commit to being fully present to their children. And without that, there's no advice that I can give. There's no technique I could give that would be adequate without those two commitments first. Mm. So understand that in my my feeling is that children are gifts to their parents and parents are gifts to their children and please parents please be open and aware of what is the lesson that your child is bringing you i've worked with every every difficult diagnosis i don't really believe in diagnoses i just believe that the answer is love 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 presence so when you have a child that you didn't expect, when they have behaviors you didn't expect, it's really about the invitation, how present can I be? How loving can I be? How forgiving can I be? Mm. Uh, that is really my most important. I feel like even if I offered any other suggestion, people would focus on that instead of the most important thing, which mm. is, and I'm sure you have something to say about your own journey through this with your children and, and why that's important, mm. being present to your own healing and, and realizing that your children are giving you this mm. gift. You're in partnership, uh, but we must stay present. And so I, I I, I'm sure you have great advice about this as well. I, I, um, I feel that whether your children are biologically yours or not, I feel that they were predestined to be yours. Okay, that's my belief. And I believe that you are in each other's lives for a reason. And, you know, parenting is tough. <laughs> it is tough, tough, tough. And, you know, you go through these hard times that you think you're never going to get through. You question your ability as a parent. You think, am I showing up in the right way? Am I doing the right things? Have I created this? Did I not do enough when they were three? Did I not read them enough books? Did I not? You, you, you question absolutely everything when your child is going through something. So I think the first thing is almost get over yourself, <laughs> you know, because, you know, you, you do that. And, and, and that's your first go to because you take responsibility for everything for your child. And then once you push yourself out of the way, then you can think, okay, how, how do I show up here? What is this triggering for me? Because your children don't listen to what you say, they watch what you do. So if you're not doing the work yourself, your children aren't gonna do the work. They're not gonna be in that zone. And it's tough, it's tough. Like I've got professional training in this and there are times in my parenting journey, I've just gone, man, I'm, I'm, are we going to get through this? You know, how, how can I show up in a different way? What am I not seeing here? You know, how can I connect? How can I facilitate this growth, this journey, this lesson? And, and so, you know, the, I think the, 
biggest thing is the commitment. Just show up every day. Like even when things are not going beautifully as you would love them to, trust that if you keep showing up and you keep doing the work and you keep being present, it's going to pass. You know, this too shall pass. And going through it together brings a bond between you and your child that you could never have even possibly imagined. So this is so perfect, Kathy, because uh, I know we've talked about this offline, but it's another thing to do a short podcast on this. Um, but this is exactly the work because I'm going to get a little esoteric here um, or a little spiritual, which is what if we really chose our parents? What if we really chose our children? I'm not asking people to believe that. I'm just asking you to invite that contemplation. And what if there were lessons we needed to learn from each other that only could be delivered by my parent or by my child? Um, then it helps me look at this in a different way. Mm -hmm. And instead of like putting the focus on the other, whether it's the teacher the 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 other parent the other siblings the the child who is the identified patient when we take away the judgment everything opens up so there's a um and again if, if people go to peter stapleton's website they'll be able to download this thing about tapping but we also there's a there's a, a video called tapping in the classroom uh, that I uh, produced uh, when I first went to Sandy Hook. And I called a deep, a, a dear friend of mine who was a eighth grade teacher uh, in, in the United States, eighth grade is like 12, 13. And um, I said, look, I, I can teach you tapping in a short period of time. And I'm just going to ask you to do an experiment. Would you, would you do a tapping meditation every morning with your, with your kids? with your eighth graders for a month and see what happens. So this, this video is online, which you can, and uh, there was 78 million views after the last time I saw it and then I, I forgot about it. But my dear friend, Maura Mar, who's the teacher of eighth graders, introduced every morning, for, she introduced a 10 minute meditation in which they tapped on everything they didn't feel comfortable about um and then they went into a meditation then they journaled anyway after teaching these kids how to tap they uh in one month test scores were up absences were down illnesses were down cooperation was up understanding was up um like bullying was down because now children who tapped and again that would be a, probably another podcast for us mm -hmm. um Children who tapped realize this sense of connectedness. And when Johnny was misbehaving, after they had tapped every morning, the kids would just raise their hand and say, Johnny seems to be upset about something. We'd like to tap with him. Wasn't that he was being a bad kid? Mm. It was, there was no judgment. And so then, and also when you tap with each other, there's a benefit because everybody's, physiology regulates. So I can't say enough about tapping as a self-regulation tool. And then when I work with parents and teachers, they, we, gain ac we, we gain acceptance from the parents and the teachers. Hey, parent, are you willing, if, the kid, if your child says, I think you need to tap mom, will you be do it? Will, will you do it? Mm -hmm. And then they say that, then she says that to them. And that driving to school, um, not that people drive to school anymore, but like, however that looks, it's like the kids are, there's a lot of ruckus. Let's tap, even though we don't want to go to school today. Uh, we love and accept ourselves anyway. So EFT tapping is a self-esteem tool. It's a self regulate it literally regulates your physiology. I don't want to talk about the, what to do with the kids, I want the parents to study this. 
Mm. I want parents to learn how to self-regulate and, and, and regulate their stress hormones, which are abundant in an impossible world. Well, now we've not only there's a two, two parents are working and now your kids are at home and you, there's the huge uncertainty of when they're going back to school, when they're going to be at home, how are you going to care for them? In that level of uncertainty, it's about parents doing the work and literally being fully present in love to their children who are simply trying to give them information. Mm. So if, if we feel a disconnect, which is kind of a human condition, you, it's a, so important to find the ability to connect. Mm. How can I connect to my child? How do I recognize that this is my child? How do I recognize my behaviors, my love, my, my problems, my challenges in my child? Because mm. in every moment that we don't do that, we're, 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 not, we're rejecting our children. We're feeling separate from our children. So the, I guess the third thing would be simply to find those moments of connectedness in every way, shape, and form. Don't expect your children to do it. Yeah. yeah. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And what I loved and picked up about what you said before was the word comfortable. And I think we are all too hung up on being comfortable. And some of the greatest connections I've had with my own children is through the most excruciatingly uncomfortable conversations we've ever had in our lives. And holding space for that with no judgment <clears throat> from a place of love. And it's conversations I never thought we would have. But being able to go there, you know, and not pretend it's not happening, not pretend it doesn't exist, because that shows up as depression, anxiety, all sorts of different things, instead of just getting down, meeting them where they are, and having these uncomfortable conversations. And, and well, they, they get the greatest gift. So the one easiest exercise I would invite people into is, uh, I talk about negative ego, which is all that bar part of your brain that tells you why you're alone, why you're a victim, why you're martyred, why you're self in self-pity, why you're not doing anything perfectly, why you're not worthy and deserving, all that stuff. And then there's the heart, the energy of the heart. And so we know when, when, when we're in our negative ego, when, when one of my children triggers me, course I want to come back with all the reasons why it's not me he has nothing to do with me but I notice what's happening in my body and I notice that my breathing is shallow and I notice that my muscles are contracted and I notice I have this monkey mind of dit, dit, dit. it's always been Johnny because Johnny does this 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 and this and that's why it has nothing to do with me does that make any sense yeah like we have all the objections when we're in our hearts we take a breath, the breathing is expanded, our muscles feel relaxed. There is a better communication between the heart and the brain in which we can start to regulate with endorphins in our bodies. We have the medicine in our fingertips to create the flow of endorphins and to, again, I don't think I can use this metaphor anymore. Push the mental clutch in because there's no more clutch cars. Um, but some people will remember that, you know, just, just pushing that clutch in and taking a breath and, and knowing as parents that when you imagine your heart connected to your child's heart and just allow yourself a few seconds of that, that will shift everything, mm. everything. And then we will know, like, it's not anybody's fault. It's simply, oh, let me drop into my heart right now. Will I drop into my heart? How quickly will I drop into my heart to understand and appreciate and send love? And then the more I do that, the more excited I am to do it. 
the less excited I am to figure out why that's happening or blah, blah, blah. It's like in Rwanda and Australia, in these difficult communities, in these horribly traumatized communities, I ask, what do you want more than your grief and trauma? It's a hard question to ask, but I would ask that of our parents who are listening. What do you want more than your grief and trauma and whatever seems to be your contraction or your complaints or your fears? Because you know, those complaints are just fears, right? And so that's what I would invite our parents to step into is how courageous are you mm. to be in fully present in your heart and recognize that whatever your child is doing is giving you a gift of healing, a potential. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's so simple to do actually, but so powerful. Like everybody on this call who can listen to this can do that it's something that you don't need money you don't need resources you don't need any of that everybody listening can do that they can drop into their heart quieten the mind and get that love connection again and work from that place so powerful love is just a breath away mm -hmm. presence is just a breath away loving your children is just a breath away beautiful beautiful well dr laurie that was such a powerful conversation thank you so so much for joining me today and i'm sure that everybody listening will get so so much value from that so empowering thank you for inviting me <laughs> beautiful okay everybody i'm going to put dr laurie's details in the notes as well as peter stapleton's details as well so that you can access all of these wonderful resources to empower yourselves today. Thank you so much for listening and I'll speak to you next time.